Um, today, um, we're going to be starting a new series, um, messages, four-week series, that we're calling Fearless. And um, I thought it would be apropos for us to kind of talk about some of the things that we're feeling and, and some, of the, some of the things that are happening around us and how do we deal with it and what does it mean. And, and I know right now, you know, you just turn on the news, turn on anything that's telling us about current events of some kind, and you're, you're gripped by this sense of fear. There is a fear that is permeating our culture right now. And it's, it, you know, one thing after another. The coronavirus, of course, is at the foundation of all this. But then we've got, you know, riots and, and all these kind of things and the animosity and, the, and, and just there, there's just so much going on. Um, it feels in a lot of ways like our world has been turned upside down in the last six, seven months. And our country doesn't look the same as it did even a year ago. And, you know, and with this comes a fear and comes a what's next and what's going to happen. And so I want us to spend some time to talk about, about fear. Um, back when I was in junior high school, um, many moons ago, um, there was, a, there was an upperclassman, he was, in, he was in the grade above me, his name was Steve, and Steve was um, your typical jock kind of guy, kind of strong, he was kind of bigger build, shorter guy, but, but still kind of strong, right? And Steve was a bully. Steve, probably because of his lack of height, overcompensated and liked to pick on kids who were younger and smaller than him. And I happened to be younger and smaller than him at the time. Um, and he used to torture me in middle school. And um, he was like a freshman and I was like seventh grade or something like that. And uh, he would just find, we would sit and we would go on, on these tournaments and I had made the soccer team. And he'd sit behind me in the van and flick my ears, you know. And I'd try not to let it, you know, show him that it bothered me, but he would black and blue my ears. Um, there were a couple times when he pushed me up against the wall, lifted me up off the ground because I was kind of small. I was a small seventh, seventh grader. And uh, he was just a bully. And, it, you know, I used to hate seeing him coming and, you know, it used to bother me. There was a fear of, you know... Some of you have, have experienced that. Some of you know what I'm talking about, that fear that, that comes. And fear grips, grips us sometimes. And there is a bully that, that is current in our culture right now, and it's the bully of fear. And he's prowling around our life constantly. And like every bully, fear exaggerates its power. It shouts threats and warnings and keeps us on edge, making us watch our every move. Um, fear is, is something that it, it, it's in our culture and alive in our culture today. We fear the coronavirus. We fear terrorism. We fear going broke. We fear that our investments won't allow us to retire. We fear cancer. We fear staying where we are and we fear going somewhere else. We fear not living up to expectations. We fear not being in the popular group and so on, and so on, and so on. And we fear and, 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 and watch the news and wonder when the next shoe is going to drop and when the next executive order is going to come out from, you know, the governor that's going to close down my business and it's going to, you know, cause people to not want to buy things or do things. It's going to keep me in my house and one thing after another. And when the bully fear moves in, everything else moves out. Fear and happiness cannot live in the same heart. Fear and clear thinking cannot live in the same body. Fear and confidence cannot coexist. Fear never cured a disease. Fear never brought a family out of poverty. Fear never fought a war. Fear never saved a marriage. Fear leaves us curled up in a fetal position. It always takes the easy way out and always plays it safe. And fear lets everyone else do the living while we do the existing. And we need to talk about fear. 
Fear is a bully lurking in the hallways of life telling us to retreat and go another way. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm sick and tired of fear and playing into the fear culture in which we live. And yeah, there's stuff going on around us, and I'm not saying we deny the stuff that's happening around us. But we as Christians, especially Christians, don't need to live in fear. Should not live in fear. Be careful? Certainly. Take precautions? Certainly. But not live in fear. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 8 today. Matthew chapter 8, and it's a, it, it's, it's a familiar story for some of us. Um, but find Matthew chapter 8. It's the beginning of your New Testament. First book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 8. Okay, And that's what we're going to pick up. But before we go there, before we get there, I want to read this passage of Scripture to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Because... In case you check out and have to leave early and you stop paying attention to me and, you know, the mask makes you sleepy and you fall asleep, whatever, okay? This is where we're going today. Because as we talk about fear, really what we're talking about is faith. The Apostle Paul writes 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. In the English Standard Version, he says this, For we walk by faith, not by sight. And here's what he's talking about. In the context of those verses, you go back and read the context. He's talking to a church that is under heavy persecution. He's talking to a church in which Christians are facing life and death struggles because of their faith. And they're talking about what happens after they die and what happens to this body and, and why do we have to keep on living and what is all this about. And, and, and um, you talk about crisis after crisis, you know, it makes the coronavirus looks like a, you know, a, a sniffle, right? Th this is real terror they were living with. And Paul is reminding them in this passage that we as Christians need to walk by faith, not by sight. In other words, that the way we behave and our emotions and, and, and how we react to life should not be based on the things we see. Oh my goodness, this is happening. Oh my goodness, this is happening. Oh my goodness, this, you know, and you know what I'm talking about, the numbers on the television screen and all the, you know, cases in the United States and around the world and the death and all this and that and, and where it's in our county and what's happening in our hospitals and, you know, and all this stuff. And oh my goodness, or, you know, is my business going to close? And oh my goodness, I lost my job. And oh my goodness, you know, and all these things that we see are driving our emotions and driving us to react and react and react. And Paul is reminding these Christians in a much worse scenario that we are to walk by faith, not by the things we see. Yes, your neighbor just got dragged out of his house and, 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 and dragged to a court and thrown to the lions or thrown in jail because he's, a, he's, he's in your church and he's part of your small group and he, you know, because of his faith. And oh my goodness, the Romans could be coming and knocking on your door next. Oh my goodness. And Paul says, look, 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 don't live in fear. We don't live by what we see. We don't just react to what's happening around us. We as Christians have something greater to live for. We have a hope to look to. And so we are to walk by faith, not by what we see. So that's where we're going today. And Jesus is going to kind of demonstrate this for his disciples. So now take your Bibles. We're over in Matthew chapter 8. Now, Matthew chapter 8, it's one of those, it's one of those moments um, it's one of those moments that, you know, it's a teaching moment for Jesus, okay? Now, the day, um, if you read back in, in, the, in chapter 8, Matthew woke up that morning um, to, to a not an ordinary day so far. I mean, you go back and read some of the things that have happened so far, Jesus has done some remarkable things even this morning. He healed a bunch of leper people. He healed Peter's mother-in-law who was sick. He, he's been healing and doing things miraculously all morning. So then Jesus comes and he tells his guys, hey, we're going to go across the lake, go get in a boat. To which the disciples and Matthew are going, oh, 
okay, this has been pretty exciting, but the boat thing, that's pretty normal, right? I mean, we got a bunch of fishermen. They're familiar with boats. We're just, this is going to be a nice pleasure cruise and relaxation from all the crowd and all the noise and all the excitement and all the stuff that's been going on. We're just going to get in the boat and go across, right? And so Jesus gets in the boat, and he's pretty exhausted from all the healing and the crowds and all this kind of stuff. And he goes down, and he finds himself a nice cushy little net to lay on or whatever. He goes to sleep. So let's pick up this story. We're in Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 23. Then Jesus got into the boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Verse 23, verse 24. Suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Now, I want to break this down for you just a little bit because, you know, in, in our world, um, things get topsy-turvy, right? Things get turned upside down. Things get rough, right? And for us, Although, like Matthew, sometimes our days start out pretty normal, some things kind of hit us, right? And when Matthew remembers this storm, this was a gigantic storm. In, in our passage, it says a furious storm. The word actually used in the Greek here is the word seismos, which is, which is only used a couple other times in the New Testament to indicate earth-shaking, this, this was not your run-of-the-mill storm. This is, just, you know, hey, like we had this morning, it rained a little bit in the wind, and when I was driving in here this morning, there was some lightning and stuff. It was really pouring in DL when I left, and, um, you know, that was a pretty good storm. That's not the kind of storm that we're talking about here. This was a storm of earth-moving, I mean, this, the waves were crashing, and these fishermen, these men, most of which who were very familiar with boats, very familiar how to handle this, uh, you know, this, this large uh, lake. They were fearful. They were, oh my goodness, this is the real deal. Water's coming up over. They're, they're freaking out a little bit, right? So although this started out, you know, kind of nice, it didn't end that way. This was no ordinary, we can handle it kind of storm. This storm was pushing hard even the most experienced of sailors. They were sitting ducks out in the middle of this big lake with no recourse, no solutions, totally at the mercy of whatever happened next. You ever been there? Been at the mercy of whatever happens next? At the mercy of the company or the boss you work for? At the mercy of the judge presiding over your case? At the mercy of your spouse calling you back? At the mercy of the bank or the credit company that you owe money to? At the mercy of your parents to help you out? At the mercy of the governor who's going to hand down some more stuff? Or the mercy of, you know, your neighbors or, or co-workers or whatever? The waves are coming over the boat and it's only a matter of time. Wave after wave of bills, waves of discouragement, waves of heartache. We think if one more wave hits me, I'm sunk. If he comes home one more time drunk, if they cut any more hours from work, if she creates one more problem for us, we've been there. And maybe we're there right now. And your whole world is shaking like theirs was. And if you notice, the storm came suddenly without warning. You know, Sometimes there are storms in life that we can see coming, right? But then sometimes there's storms that come out of nowhere. You remember what we were thinking back in January and February when we started hearing of this virus thing over in China and there, you know, it seemed to be happening, but it was a long way away. Far from our thoughts. And then all of a sudden, March hit. And it felt like the floodgates opened. And it was like, whoa! And before we knew it, two weeks into March, everything shuts down. We can't come to church anymore. We can't go to work anymore. 
we can't go do the things that life was like, you know, go, things we took for granted, going to the restaurant, going to the movies, going, you know, doing the things that we've all been very accustomed to doing, all of a sudden we couldn't do. Sometimes storms come out, come out of nowhere. A doctor's visit, a simple exam that was meant to be nothing, turns into something with a phone call, right? And you and I need to understand that sometimes storms in life come out of nowhere. And we have to be able to, to, to handle it. We have to know what to do. In, in Paul's day, when he was dealing with that persecution, every knock at the door of a Christian could be some more Romans looking to drag you away and put you in prison for your faith. Talk about having a, you know, kind of a skittish every time somebody neighbor came over, you know, gave you a heart attack. Can I borrow some milk? What are you doing? The s- disciples were trying to handle the storm. What was Jesus doing? What was Jesus doing? I love this part because it, y- you know, Jesus knew this was coming. He knew it was going to happen. And you can almost, you can almost envision Jesus kind of going, I'm just going to go crash here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep and see what these guys do. Right? And suddenly the fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And Jesus responded, why are you afraid? You have so little faith. This gets back to our point for today. And that verse I brought up at the beginning. That this really, their fear was really about their lack of faith. As it is for us. Why are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the waves and suddenly there was a great calm. And the disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. For even the winds and the waves obey him. Today, as we look at this, I want to I dissect for you three questions and the corresponding action that goes with the answer to these questions, depending on how you answer. You see, I think the disciples, when they found themselves in the middle of that storm, and the waves were crashing over, and they, they panicked, there were three questions that they had. And it's the same questions that I would argue that you and I have in the midst of our crisis, in the midst of the fear that surrounds us in our culture right now. There are three questions that we must answer, and how we answer them will dictate then how we move forward. And the first question on your outline, the first question is this. God, are you there? God, are you there? You know, when storms hit and fear grips us, sometimes, oftentimes, when we are gripped in fear, we lose sight of God. The disciples were in the boat. Keep in mind, remember, they, they had just spent the day with Jesus. Jesus had just done some remarkable things. And not just this day, for a bunch of days before this. <coughs> they had seen Jesus heal the sick. They had seen Jesus raise the dead. They had seen Jesus do remarkable things. They had listened to him teach. And yet, as they sat in the boat and the storm gripped them, they lost sight of who was laying right there asleep. They kind of lost themselves. And here's what you and I need to understand. That when we live in the grip of fear, security and safety become our God. Everything else goes out the window. All I want is security. All I want is safety. All I want is the storm to stop and me not to have to drown or whatever. And when we feel life is in danger, when we feel that our world is turned upside down, 
when we are gripped by fear, we lose sight of God and safety and security become our God. And we begin doing everything toward that goal and that goal alone. And that's why you and I have to be able to answer this question better. That in the midst of any storm we're in, whether it be financial or relational or health or anything else, when we are in a crisis, we cannot allow, allow fear to blind us to God's presence, to forget that He's there with us, to, to the exclusion of everything else going toward our safety and security. You see, as Christians, life isn't about safety and security. Life is about bringing glory to our Heavenly Father and living each and every day walking by faith in who He is and what He wants us to do. As the Christians in Paul's day did, or were supposed to. But you see, we come to this moment and, and you know, you know what I'm talking about. You've been in those crisis moments and, and, and that diagnosis comes through or we lose that job or, or something else happens, the marriage breaks apart and we look up to heaven and we wonder aloud or we wonder to ourselves, God, are you there? God, it doesn't feel like you're there. I mean, here the disciples are in the boat and things are happening and Jesus isn't right there with them. He's not like holding their hand and, you know, it doesn't feel like he's there. there you can just kind of, Where, where's Jesus? Where'd you? Oh, he's over there. He's sleeping. He's not paying attention to what's happening. Is he not concerned? What's going on here? And sometimes when we get gripped by fear, we feel like God's not paying attention. It's like, God, have you noticed what's going on? Have you noticed the coronavirus thing and 160,000 cases and, you know, and deaths and all, you know, whatever? I mean, have you noticed all this stuff? God, people are dying and suffering and all this stuff and it's spreading and people are afraid and all this. God, are you paying attention? And I get it. It's easy for us to get there. It's easy for us to think that maybe God went to sleep or, you know. But you and I have to remember that God promised to be with us. Take your Bibles real quick. Go to, go to Psalm 19. Sometimes, sometimes we just need to remember. Hold, hold on to Matthew 8. Go over to Psalms in the middle, middle of your Bible. Psalm 19. This is a beautiful psalm. In Psalm 19, David is the psalmist here, and he says this in verse 1, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display His craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak, and night after night they make Him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. Christian, listen. Sometimes when we're afraid, and we find ourselves in the boat, and the waves are crashing through, we need to remember that God is there. That He's never left. But here's the hard part. Because you and I, we have to understand. In this scenario, did Jesus know this storm was coming? Yeah, he did. Jesus knew the storm was coming. Could Jesus have calmed the storm before it ever started? Could he have just said, hey, wind and waves, I'm going to take a nap. I'd rather not be bothered. Just forget the storm thing. Just let us cross. Sure, he could have done that, but he didn't. Why not? If he could do that, he would have saved them a lot of trouble, would have saved the disciples a lot of fear and anxiety and all these problems. Because God is not in the business of making your life easy. That's not what God is doing. God is not interested in just making your life easy and smooth sailing. 
that God will often bring storms in your life to teach you to trust Him, to teach you to look to Him. And in this moment of their fear, that storm did turn, have them turn to Jesus. Oh yeah, Jesus is right there. Let's go get. Wake up, wake up. And sometimes God sends storms into your world. Sometimes God sends storms into our culture to wake up God's people so that we turn to Him and remember Him. And we walk by faith, not by sight. And sometimes when you're in the midst of the storm, whatever that is, whatever the storm is, Sometimes we just need to go to Psalm 19 or others, many, many others like it to remind ourselves that God is still here. He hasn't gone anywhere. He's still alive. He's still sitting on the throne. God hasn't gone to sleep somewhere in the boat where he's not paying attention and coronavirus is out of control. No, no, no. God has it all in his hand. Is it going to be everything you want it to be? Probably not. Is he going to handle it the way you think he ought to handle it? Probably not. Is he going to let you rock in the boat and, and, and see the waves crashing up through? Sure. Probably. You see, we love the passages, and as you go through the story, we love the part where he stood up and said, cut it out. I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, peace be still, and the waves stop. We love that part. We want God to kind of step in right now to the United States and, and the world and go, okay, that's enough, coronavirus, you're done, see ya, right? And it disappeared. We love that, we love that part. But God doesn't do that all the time. And part of walking by faith means we trust Him, right? Now, you may be here and or watching online and you don't know who God is. And you kind of doubt his existence. And you, you know, and, and in the midst of this kind of stuff, you're going, where is God? How come he's not showing up? How come he's not? Listen, listen, listen. Jesus came in such a moment. Jesus came into a world that was in crisis, particularly the, the, the Jewish nation in crisis. They were conquered. They were looking for the Messiah, but they were, you know, Rome was in charge and there was a lot of confusion about who God is and what he's about and, you know, what are we supposed to do and how do we get in his good graces and how does he like us and all these kind of things. There was a lot of confusion in Jesus' world. And the Bible tells us that one of the reasons Jesus came, one of the things that he came to do was he came to show us who the Father is. I put some of the verses on your outline, but if you look at some of these in John 1.18 and Luke 2.32, the scriptures clearly show that Jesus came to show us the Father. In other words, the way Jesus behaved and the way he lived and his heartbeat and what he loved and what was important to him was all demonstrating to us who God is and what's important to him and how we're supposed to live with him. And a number of weeks ago when we talked about Jesus, we talked about the, the, the sacrifice he made on the cross, I said that Jesus gave us all an invitation. And if you're here and, and, and you're wondering, is God there? You're wondering, is, is there really some sense to all this? Or is it just some random virus mutation thing that just happens because of biology and because of evolution and all these kind of things? But you're wondering, is there a God? And you're crying out to him. My, my thing to you is this. Is that Jesus' invitation to you would be the same as it was to them in his day. Jesus says, you don't know who God is? You don't know where he is? You don't know what this is all about? Come follow me. Come follow me and learn who God is. Come follow me and listen to my words. And I will lead you to the Father. I will lead you to who God is. You'll come to know who I am, the Son of God. Come follow me. And for Christians who you're struggling and you're, you're gripped in fear and you've kind of lost sight of God, maybe for us we need to start following Him again. We need to realize He's in the boat with us. He hasn't left us. And we need to start listening to Him again. And we need to start following Him again so that we can walk by faith and not by sight. 
So those of you that are, are kind of wondering about God and are you there and maybe we need to start following him again. Number two, the second question we come up with is probably not news to anybody. Not only do we ask God, are you there? But we ask God, do you care? Do you care? See, for a lot of Christians, this is where you are, right? We, we, we don't really, we don't worry about the are you there. Some of us, we grew up in church long enough. We went to Sunday school. We learned the verses, all that. It's deep-rooted in us that God is there. There is a God. He is there. But when we come to these kind of moments of crisis and we come to these moments of, of, of just upheaval and fear, then our question is, God, I think you're there. I believe you're there, but I'm wondering if you really care. God, have you noticed what's going on with me? Have you noticed my bank account's draining down to zero? Have you noticed what's happening over here? Have you noticed my country? Have you noticed this person, my neighbor, or my, my, my family member who got sick? God, do you care what's happening? I know you're there, but I'm wondering if you really care. It kind of seems like you don't. And we lose sight of the compassion and the love of God. Let me show you this. Romans chapter 8. Hold on to Matthew 8. We'll come back. Go to Romans 8. Paul, who wrote the first verse we looked at in, in 2 Corinthians, also wrote the book of Romans. Kind of wrote it to, to, to uh, the, now he's writing to Roman Christians who are primarily Gentiles in Rome, again, during a time of persecution. And I want you, I want you to see this. I want you to read along with me. In Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 31, listen to what he says, keeping in mind the context of what's happening in, in Paul's time. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Again, context. There are a lot of folks, there are a lot of things that are against them. There are a lot, I mean, they, they are coming down. There's persecution. There's both from, from Jewish communities and from the Romans. And, I mean, this is bad. If God is for us, who can be against us? Watch this. Since he, talk about God, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with him. That's that justification word that is some of your translations. We are justified. We are made right, declared righteous by God because of our faith in Christ. Who then will condemn us? No one, he says. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting, listen to this, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything, watch this, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it, watch, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Sound from right? I mean, these guys lived in fear of their lives. They lived in constant fear of being persecuted and put to death. They, they lived in hunger. They lived destitute. They lived with troubles and calamities. And he says, does any of that mean, can that, any of that separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he doesn't love us if we have these things? As the scriptures say, verse 36, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, he says, verse 37, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. 
And then he goes on and says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's some powerful stuff. If that doesn't give us something to hope for, if that doesn't give our heart an extra beat in the midst of all this coronavirus, in the midst of all this stuff, the, 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 the financial collapsing and all the joblessness and the, the, the loneliness and the aching of wanting to be with our loved ones and we can't and all of these things that just drive us in the ground. Paul is reminding us that despite all of this, God's love is with us and he has never stopped and never will stop loving us, ever. And yeah, it's bumpy. And yeah, there's stuff going on. And yeah, we wish and we pray, God, would you please just stand up and calm the waves and the wind? I can't take it anymore. But God wants something more from us. And he wants something more for you than your safety and security. He wants your faith. He wants you to walk with him. But we can rest assured in these verses and the others that I've listed for you that he loves us. And then take your Bibles real quick. Go to John. John finishes his gospel. John chapter 20. This is kind of a a mission statement, if you will, of why he wrote this gospel. And in John chapter 20, well, that's Luke chapter 20. I need John chapter 20. I'm sure Luke 20 is good too, but in John chapter 20, in verse 31, John writes and he says, but these are written, talking about the book of John, this gospel, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life by the power of His name. You see, if you're wondering if, if, if God cares, then what we have to do is we have to believe what Jesus says. We have to believe in His words. Believe in who He is. Believe He's in the boat with us, that He's not forsaken us. And it may feel like He's sleeping, but He's wanting to teach you something. And we have to believe in Him. And believe in His love for us. As Paul wrote, nothing can separate. Number three. Number three on your outline. Christians also are here. You know, we, we get the, okay, God, I, I get that you're there. And I even believe the passages like John 3.16 and some of these others that talk about your love. And I believe you care. But really, it comes down to this last one, and it is this. God, can I trust you? God, can I trust you? Because, because, when we're in the boat and the waves are coming in, in our minds, that's not good. To our reckoning, to our line of thinking, waves, water coming in boats, not a good thing. Because I know the Archimedes principle about floating and all these kind of things, and I know you get too much water in the boat, it sinks, and I can't swim, and that's bad. So in my thinking, I'm seeing the waves and the storm and going, this is a bad thing, God. Come on, how come you can't see things eye to eye with me, you know? And, and, and what God is saying in that moment, as the waves are crashing and things are happening, God looks at us and says, will you trust me? I know what's best for you. I know what you need more than you know what you need. But God, I'd really like it to be smooth. I'd like the storm to go away. God, I'd really like to be able to get my job back and be able to go to the movies again and be able to not wear these 
masks that are driving me crazy, right? I mean, you know, come on, God, that's good. That's a good thing. The way we're living now is not good, and God, can you just get rid of it? And God says to you and I, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Because for the disciples, the water coming in the boat in that moment was God saying, do you trust me? You need these waves. You need this storm. You need to feel this now because this storm is going to point you to me and it's going to teach you who I am in a better way and it's going to get you to trust me more than you did an hour ago. You see, it's the, it's the, it's the old adage with Adam and Eve, right? Right? When God said, you can eat anything, just don't eat that tree. That fruit right there. Eat everything else, don't eat that. And ultimately, Adam and Eve ate that fruit because they did not trust God. They didn't trust Him. They thought God was holding out. Oh, why wouldn't you let us eat that? Something's, you know, and of course Satan came in and really prodded that along. And here we go, right? And here we sit. And in the same way, God comes and he brings a storm and something, and we can't possibly see the good of it. But as Romans tells us, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That as Christians, part of walking by faith is trusting that God knows what he's doing and that so long as I follow him, the storms are going to come, things are going to happen, but I can trust him. But we all come to a time, sometimes a lot, when we ask the question, God, can I trust you? Can I trust you? I want you to see this. Acts chapter 8. Watch this. Acts chapter 8. Hold on to Matthew 8. We'll come back there in just a second. Acts 8. This is, this is a moment when the persecution just started. Now there were several waves. In the early church, there were several waves of persecution. Like persecution started, then it got better, then it got worse, then it got really worse, and then it got better, and you know, so there were these waves. Well, this was the first wave, and I want you to watch something here. Acts chapter 8. It just, Acts chapter 7 was all about introducing Saul, who would later become Paul. But Saul was that Pharisee who was so zealous for Judaism, he was hunting down Christians and throwing them in prison, and I mean, he was the guy. And so when you get to chapter 7, you have the deacon Stephen stoned, right? He's the first martyr of Christians. He is stoned. He's brought before the people. They stone him to death. And, it, and chapter 7 ends with Paul being Saul being the witness and agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. That's Acts chapter 1, verse, I mean, eight, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And watch this now. And a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. In other words, this huge torrent of persecution. And these Pharisees and religious leaders are just tearing down doors and ripping Christians out of their homes. Now imagine now, you're one of those new believers. You came to Christ just weeks prior. I mean, you're excited. You're seeing things happen. This is great. There's thousands of you. And all of a sudden, the guards start showing up. And they're ripping you out of your homes. And, and Christians start fleeing, right? They're running for their lives because they're getting rounded up. Bad things are happening. Now, in the midst of that storm, it would be easy for, for the Christians of that day to go, what's the, what's the deal? 
the Holy Spirit came, there was all this stuff and miracles happening, and now I'm running for my life. Why? How could this be a good thing, God? How could this ever be a, you know, for my good thing? That's, you know, what are you talking about? This is bad. This is bad. I just lost my house. I lost my job. I have my kids in tow, and we're running for the hills. God, how is this a good thing? This seems like a really bad thing, God, because now I can't talk to my neighbors about Jesus anymore. And I can't do all this stuff I was doing on my street, you know. I was just about to start a small group in my home, my little village, my little town area here. And the, I had these neighbors. They were coming. This is going to be good. And now I can't do it. God, how is this good? Right? But watch. When you go down to verse 4. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Remember at the book of, beginning of the book of Acts when Jesus was leaving and he said to his disciples and he gave them the great commission and he said go and preach and all these and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. Remember that? Well up to chapter 8 of Acts they had kind of pretty much stayed right there in Jerusalem. And God was about to use this persecution to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. And that's the part where you and I have to understand. If we were Christians in that day and I just lost my house and I'm running for my life and my neighbor got arrested and he's in jail and he can't get out and all these, and I'm running, I don't know what the future holds, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what that means, but you know what they did do? They held on to their faith, they trusted God, and they remained obedient to what God told them to do. They didn't run to the next town and then pout and hide and, you know, God, what's all this thing about? No, no, no. They looked at it as an opportunity. And every town they were chased to, they spread the gospel of Jesus. And the next town they were chased from and to, to another, they spread the gospel of Jesus. And pretty, new, pretty soon, the movement called the church really began to take shape. All because God used a storm to drive them out of their comfort. Now listen, listen, listen. This is important. This pandemic that we're living in, yeah, it stinks. And yeah, we need to be praying for our leaders, and we need to be praying for the people who are suffering, and we need to be praying for our doctors and nurses and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, life is tough right now. But listen to me, church, this is also an opportunity for us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who need it the most. It is not time for Christians to cower in their houses in fear, not knowing what to do and staying huddled together and not talking to anybody. It is time for us to get out and to tell people about Jesus and to show them the hope we have in Christ. That yes, is a pandemic, and yes, wear your mask, and yes, social distance, and all those kind of things. But it does not mean that we cannot be obedient to the gospel of Jesus, which means there are people out there who are just as scared, but have no hope like you do, who need Jesus Christ. So it's time for the church to shine bright for Jesus. It's time for us to stand up and walk by faith and not by sight. Right? And the last thing, as, we, as, as, as I conclude here, is this on, on your outline. When we're in a storm, we have to remember it's not about the storm. We need to get our eyes off the storm. And get our eyes on who we discover in the storm. Who's there with us? What is he trying to teach us? What does he want us to do? Like those Christians being chased from their homes, running to different towns and areas. They looked for the opportunity for God to use them. Because they knew Jesus was with them. Because he promised he would be with them. It's time for us to discover who is in the storm with us. And what does he want us to do? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.
Christian, we can live fearless lives. We should if we are willing to walk by faith and not by sight. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to come out of your fear and recognize that we have a job to do that doesn't stop just because of a pandemic? It doesn't stop just because we have to wear a mask and we have to keep our distance. We still have a voice. There are still things we can do to bring people to Jesus. Father, we love you today. And God, we live in, a, we, we live in the middle of a storm. And, and, and to one degree or another, it's affecting us all. And it's swirling around us. And not only that, all the other crazy stuff going on in our world just makes us want to just huddle down, turtle down in our houses and wait till the storm passes. And we don't know how long the storm is going to last, God, but we have a job to do, and I pray that you'd give us the courage and the wherewithal to do that. Help us to shine bright for Jesus. And we love you today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And you're not going to only miss next week. Next week we go to Philippians, and Paul is, is really going to ha- show us um, kind of the peace that God can give us in the midst of storms. So don't want to miss that. Come back next week. Invite some others with you, all right? Um, I, do have, I do have an announcement real quick. Um, we, uh, I, I, have, I have really enjoyed my time here at Crossroads these last six months. And I'm going to be finishing out the month uh, with you here in August. Um, but I have accepted the call to be the new senior pastor at uh, Bethel Baptist Church in Mankato. And so my family and I are going to be moving to Mankato um, at the end of this month, beginning of next month. Um, and uh, so I, I cover your prayers about that, and, uh, but just wanted you to know uh, I, have, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time with you, and you gave me a chance to preach, and I love to do that, if you could tell, and um, so, but thank you, thank you, thank you for, for getting, for welcoming me, my family and I, and for loving me, and, and uh, just pray for us, so let, let Bruce come. Oops. Thank you, Mick. Um, we really appreciate the time you spent here. We really enjoy This is a great sermon you gave today, and uh, your leadership has been really, really great. And we, we as a congregation just uh, will lift our prayers to God that you'll continue to uh, um, grow in your ministry and that you'll do great work in Mankato. So what does that mean for Crossroads Church? Just briefly, uh, Sue Wilkin and, and Charlie Smith has been bringing us up to date on the uh, search committee. Uh, and the search committee, it takes time. And uh, it doesn't happen overnight. And we anticipate that's going to take another four to six months of, of searching and doing the right uh, steps in the process before we have a senior pastor. In the meantime, um, we will be looking to get pulpit supply in. In the month of September, uh, there'll be pulpit supply. We will be looking also to getting another interim pastor uh, until we can get through this uh, six months time. So we do have a plan. And again, we'll just ask your patience and we covet your prayers in this whole process. There is somebody out there that God is going to lead us to to uh, come in and be our senior pastor.